Hello and welcome to today's liturgy. As we break open the word and share the bread and the cup, we continue to hold you in prayer. If you need us in the meantime, please remember to touch base with us. The email and the phone numbers will be down below. Thank you so much. Friends, we gather in prayer as always in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Grace, peace, and mercy from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Today we gather to celebrate the 22nd Sunday in Ordinary Time and to prepare ourselves to celebrate these sacred mysteries we call to mind our sins and we ask for mercy and pardon. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May God Almighty have mercy upon us, forgive us our sin, and bring us to life everlasting. Let us pray that God will increase our faith and bring to perfection the gifts he has given us. Almighty God, every good thing comes from you. Fill our hearts with love for you. Increase our faith, and by your constant care, protect the good you have given us. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who is alive and rules with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. <clears throat> you duped me, O Lord, and I let myself be duped. You were too strong for me, and you triumphed. All the day I am an object of laughter. Everyone mocks me. Whenever I speak, I must cry out. Violence and outrage is my message. The word of the Lord has brought me derision and reproach all the day. I say to myself, I will not mention him. I will speak in his name no more. But then it becomes like fire burning in my heart, imprisoned in my bones. I grow weary holding it in. I cannot endure it. The word of the Lord. Thanks, sweet God.
reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, your spiritual worship. Do not conform yourselves to this age, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and pleasing and perfect. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer greatly from the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and on the third day be raised. Then Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. God forbid, Lord. No such thing shall ever happen to you. He turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an obstacle to me. You are thinking not as God does, but as human beings do. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. What profit would there be for one to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Or what can one give in exchange for their life? For the Son of Man will come with his angels in his Father's glory, and then he will repay all according to their conduct. The Gospel of the Lord. Let the church say amen. <clears throat> amen again. So as we looked last week, we are in the 16th chapter of Matthew, and the tide is beginning to change in Jesus' life. I will get to the gospel passage in a little bit, but um, again, part of the historical understanding that I would like to bring to this, uh, uh, to this passage would be this. Uh, maybe it starts with a question. Who do you think was the leader of the Christian community following Jesus' death? Who was it? Most of us have been taught that St. Peter took on a prominent role as the leader of the, what, is, what will eventually be called the Christian community. Um, at this time, there isn't any Christian community just immediately after Jesus' death. Now, if we look historically, who became the leader of the Jesus, what I will call the Jesus movement following his death and resurrection. Somebody we don't hear about a lot. <laughs> of course, most of us think it's Peter, but I just want you to put that on the back burner for a second. The leader of the Jesus' movement was Jesus' own brother. His name, James. Now, most Catholics already are beginning to shake in their seats and want about to turn off this, uh, uh, this homily because what do you mean Jesus had a brother? If we look into the scriptures, it's very, very interesting. Um, we find several places where the brothers and sisters of Jesus are mentioned, you know, um, and one of those brothers that is mentioned is a man by the name of James. Uh, after Jesus' death, James became the bishop, 
the leader of the church in Jerusalem. The church in Jerusalem was the mother church. There was the church of the Gentiles that was led by St. Paul. Peter was in Rome. When Paul and Peter were fighting, remember, there was this great controversy where uh, Peter went to visit Paul's church in Corinth, I think, and he ate pork. <laughs> It's all about the pork. <laughs> he had pork when he was there. And, uh, and then when he came back, the, the, the Jerusalem church chastised him and said, how can you go and eat foods that uh, the Gentiles were eating? Uh, and, and they were very upset. So uh, Paul called Peter a flip-flopper. It was, it was a huge disagreement. The first council uh, was held in Jerusalem to discuss this issue of the Gentiles. And the person who was sitting and presiding over this council wasn't Peter. James, the brother of the Lord. He's the one who was there. So, uh, now, the church in, Jeru in Jerusalem, of course, uh, was destroyed by Nero. And, and, you know, those of you who love church history will not remember this. But we can go to what is called the extra-biblical sources. And we find in there, when they talk about Jesus, they say, Jesus, the brother, they say, uh, Jesus, the brother of James, the just one. Or James, the brother of Jesus, who was called the Messiah. So for those of us who are interested in finding the pure word of Christ, how he understood the world, how he approached the world, what influenced him, if you truly want to know Jesus of Nazareth, I have a recommendation. Go and read the letter of James. Beautiful homily, beautiful uh, sermon, if you read the letter of James, you begin to understand uh, what influenced Jesus, what drove him, because these are the words of his brother. Now, most Catholics say, oh, it wasn't his brother, it was his cousin, right? Because of the Immaculate Conception. That, 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 that's why we say Jesus didn't have a brother, because we have to preserve the teaching of the Immaculate Conception. And, but, but when we look... When we look into the scriptures, we find evidence that they were, he had brothers. Now, they could be cousins, I don't know, but that's what scripture says. Um, so James is a very important part of the early church, and James can give us a great window into the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth and how he thought. Uh, coming to today's gospel passage, of course now Peter takes a prominent role uh, as, as, as the church moves to, uh, to, to Rome, he takes a prominent role and of course he is uh, considered the first pope, uh, you know, historians argue about that. That is not part of um, <laughs> today's homily, but I think it's very interesting to understand that as we read today's gospel passage. So Peter who now begins to take a very prominent role, at least for the church now in, in, in Matthew, um, today finds himself being called Satan. Get behind me. Why? Because Peter is having trouble accepting the path that is laid out for Jesus. Just last week, he professed to Jesus, you are the Messiah, the one who is coming to save us, right? The son of the living God. And Peter and the other disciples, as we said last week, have an understanding of what it means to be the Messiah. They understand him as the Davidic Messiah. And in their understanding of the Davidic Messiah who overthrows the Romans, there is no place for the suffering Messiah. What we begin to find in today's gospel passage is this strand in Jesus' life that is very central, the strand that Isaiah talks about, the strand of the suffering Messiah. That I am about to go to Jerusalem and terrible things are going to happen to me and I will be crucified. I will not be the Messiah, Peter. I will not be the Messiah that you want me to be. I will embrace my destiny and my destiny is to suffer and die. And that is unacceptable to Peter and the disciples. 
They did not leave their homes for this. They left their homes for a Messiah who would take over Jerusalem, sit on the throne, and they will be the senators. This other suffering Messiah that Jesus is presenting now when they are uh, in the 16th chapter of Matthew, they have traveled with him for a while. He has walked on water. He has fed the 5,000. He has done mi miracle upon miracle. Now he's introducing this suffering side. It is absolutely unacceptable. Let's look at ourselves and how this translates. What kind of a God do you believe in? Be honest with this question as you sit with it. Who is God to you? Could it be that at some level, at some point in your life, at some uh, yeah, level in your life, you think of God as one who bends the laws of nature to favor you? Right? The magician God. Uh, the one who intervenes and suspends the laws of nature and do it as a favor. Most of us, uh, maybe not most of us, I have sometimes in the back of my mind this magician God who intervenes, this magician God who saves me from pain, this magician God who is supposed to show up when I am in trouble and save me. I have to say that that is a pagan God. <laughs> Sorry. And truth be told, uh, that those elements of that pagan God sometimes creep into our understanding of God as presented by Jesus of Nazareth. And this is why I love this gospel passage. This gospel passage says to Simon Peter and says to each and every one of us, God will not bend the laws of nature for me. I have to learn how to find God in the storm. I have to learn how to find God in pain as well, in suffering as well. Jesus is not excused from suffering. Jesus burrows through suffering. He endures great suffering and finds something redemptive in suffering. When we look at... Um, the cross. I, I was a passionist. I love preaching about the cross, right? When we look at, at the cross and what Jesus says, his last words were, they are translated as, Eloi, Eloi, Lamba Sabakatani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Those who speak Aramaic today, the language of Jesus, say that is a little bit of a mistranslation. The words are, my God, my God, this is my destiny. Jesus accepting his destiny. Something beautiful happens when you and I accept our destiny. Yes, we ought to fight it as much as we can, but when we accept our destiny, something beautiful happens. Now, I speak from experience on this one. I once journeyed with a young lady from Lebanon, Kentucky. Her name was Michelle. She was dying of cancer. Everybody around her was fighting this. She, lying on her deathbed, accepted it. And she said, she had a, a young daughter. And she says, I won't, be, I won't be around to see my daughter grow. It's okay. I am at peace with it. And because she was at peace with it, the way that she left, she had a beautiful death because she was at peace with it. Jesus has to be comfortable, has to be at peace with his destiny, that his destiny also involves suffering. That his destiny involves being betrayed, his destiny involves being denied. He had to come to a place where he knew that God will not rescue him from that. That even God will not bend the laws of nature so that Jesus doesn't go through suffering. He goes through it with grace and in the process 
teaches us how to suffer or how to find God in the midst of the storm. The storm of cancer, the storm of divorce, the storm of raising children. Whatever storm that you are going through, we don't ask for God to save us from the storm. We ask to find peace within the storm. There is a prayer, and I've mentioned it many, many times that I love the most. The prayer of serenity. Oh Lord, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Stop. Take out a piece of paper. What are the things that you cannot change today in you? Write them down. There are some things about you that you don't even understand because they are in your genes. Maybe they jumped a generation. Maybe your grandparents were like that. Jumped a generation and you find yourselves fighting these demons within you. There are things in you that you ought to accept and say, this too is part of my sacred biography. Lord, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. There are things out there in the world that you and I cannot change. Learn. Learn to accept them. The courage to change the things that you can change. There are so many things that you and I can change. And yet, and also there are so many things that we cannot change. If there's something that can be changed, some medicine that we can take to change things, absolutely, that means we give life a fighting chance. We fight for it. But also, we need the wisdom to know the difference. And Jesus knows the difference. And so today, he can tell Peter, get behind me. This is my destiny. There are things that I will change. There are things I cannot change. And when Jesus is on that cross, he cries out, Eloi, Eloi, laba sabakatani, my God, my God, this is my destiny. There are things about my life and your life that uh, I wish never happened. Eh? I wish I never lost my father as a teenager. I wish I never lost my father as a teenager. I wish my family did not struggle with alcoholism. I wish it. I wish there was no divorce in my family. I wish it. I wish I never aged. <laughs> right? The gray hairs are beginning. I wish it. Listen. As we journey through life, there are things that you and I are going to encounter that we have to have the courage to say, it's okay, I'll follow this path. And Jesus, God, is not a great magician who waves the magic wand over my life and makes me uh, not go through troubled times. The prayer is to learn. To learn, as we said a couple of weeks ago, that we do not journey alone. To learn to follow the lead of Christ. Here, Peter, in today's gospel passage, Peter stands in front of Jesus. That is not the place of the disciple. The disciple is behind. Learn from the master how he accepted the things in his life that he could not change. And how this uh, suffering Messiah found something redemptive in the unfortunate or in the unjust economy of his life, as his life uh, uh, grew. Let us pray during this Eucharist for those who find it extremely difficult, not that their faith is weak, but just find it extremely difficult to accept a diagnosis, to accept things that they cannot change. Let us just pray that in time and with time, we find something redemptive about all our experiences. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, 
eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, one in being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he was born of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified on a Pontius Pilate. He suffered, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and life of the world to come. Amen. In faith, we now present our petitions before the Lord. Please respond, loving God, hear our prayer. For the grace and the courage to take up our crosses when necessary, we pray. Loving God, hear our prayer. For the grace to die to ourselves that we and others might experience greater life, we pray. Loving God, hear our prayer. For all of those affected by COVID-19 and all those who come to their aid, we pray. Loving God, hear our prayer. That by the word and bread that we break week after week, our lives might be transformed into a living image of God in our world. We also remember our teachers and students as they return to classes. We pray. Loving God, hear our prayer. That the departed who spent their lives in the service of Christ may follow Christ now to the kingdom promised in the gospel. We especially remember Danny Peevely. For these, we pray. Loving God, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we ask you to receive these prayers that we make in faith through Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And pray, church, that this our sacrifice may be acceptable to God our Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at our hands for the praise and glory of God's name, for our good and the good of all God's church. Merciful God, the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ made us your people. In your love, grant peace and unity to your church. We ask this through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us lift up our hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, it is our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. He is the word through whom you made the universe, the Savior you sent to redeem us. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh and was born of the Virgin Mary. For our sake, he opened his arms on the cross. He put an end to death and revealed the resurrection. In this, he fulfilled your will and won for you, your holy people. And so we join the angels and saints in proclaiming your glory as we sing.
Lord, you are holy indeed, the fountain of all holiness. Let your spirit come upon these gifts to make them holy, that they may become for us the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Before he was given up to death, a death that he freely accepted, he took bread and gave you thanks and praise. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. When supper was ended, he took the cup. Again, he gave you thanks and praise. He gave the cup to his friends and he said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be poured out for you and for all so that sins may be forgiven. Please do this in memory of me. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. In memory of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Father, this life-giving bread and this saving cup. We thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. May all of us who share in the blood and blood of Christ be brought together in unity by the Holy Spirit. Lord, remember your church throughout the world. Make us grow in love together with Francis, the Bishop of Rome, and all the bishops and clergy. Remember our brothers and sisters who have gone to their rest in the hope of rising again. Bring them and all the departed to the light of your faith. Have mercy on us all. Make us worthy to share eternal life with Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, with the apostles and with all the saints who have done your will throughout the ages. May we praise you, union with them, and give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, O mighty Father, forever and ever. And together we pray for the coming of the kingdom as our Lord Jesus Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we ourselves forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord, deliver us from everything that is evil and grant us peace in our day. In your mercy, keep us free from sin and protect us from all anxiety as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Savior, Jesus the Christ. 
Lord Jesus Christ, you say to your apostles, I leave you peace, my peace I give you. Look not on our sin, but on the faith of your church, and grant us the peace and unity of your kingdom, where you live forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, how blessed are we who are called to his supper. Lord, I'm not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and I shall be him. May the body and blood of Christ bring us to life everlasting. And let us pray. Lord, you renew us at your table with the bread of life. <clears throat> May this food strengthen us in love and help us to serve you in each other. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Awesome. May Almighty God bless us, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Mass is ended. Let us go in the peace of Christ. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Thank you.